The UAE has a desert climate and gets little to no rain a year. Plus, the country does not have any rivers or natural lakes to help provide water for its citizens. And to put further strain on the country's water supply, the country's population has continued to grow over the years. Cities like Dubai, one of the largest cities in the country, have experienced massive population growth. In 1984, Dubai had a population around 325,000. And in 2021, it had a population of 3.43 million people. So the question is, how does the UAE make sure they do not run out of water for their growing population? Well, the answer is factories and drones. Wait, what? Water, factories, and drones? I'm serious. The UAE uses a process known as desalinization, which is a process of removing salt from seawater so that it can be used for drinking water or for irrigation. Today, Dubai has some of the world's largest desalinization plants. According to the UAE government, today most of the country's potable water, 42% of the total water requirement, comes from some 70 major desalinization plants, which account for around 14% of the world's total production of of desalinated water. More recently, the country has been experimenting with cloud seeding to help create rain. This is done by using drones or sending planes into clouds, and then the drone or plane dispenses particles which cause water droplets to cluster and increases the chance of rain. These unorthodox ways of getting fresh water to the people of the UAE are just a couple different examples of a geographic concept known as environmental possibilism. This concept is the idea that the environment puts limits on society, but people have the ability to adjust the physical environment and create their own path in life. Technological advancements make it easier for people to modify their environment and create different opportunities for society. This reduces the environmental restrictions that are put on a society and opens up new possibilities for future expansion. Now, people did not always believe in possibilism. In fact, environmental determinism used to be the dominant belief. Environmental determinism states that the environment sets the possibilities for humans and society, creating restrictions that prevent a society from advancing or providing opportunities that allow for a society to flourish. This approach has been criticized by some people for promoting colonialism, justifying European imperialism, and also for discounting the role of humans and their ability to adapt to adversity. When trying to remember environmental determinism, remember that it believes that the environment determines the culture, and possibilism believes that the environment and culture influence each other. Now, when talking about human-environment interaction, we're really just talking about relationships. Human-environment interaction is how people shape the environment and how the environment shapes people. It's no secret that societies around the world are constantly modifying their environments and adapting to their changing landscape. We as a society cut down trees to build homes. We drive cars and fly planes that emit CO2, which warm the earth. We pave over arable land to grow our expanding urban areas. We ship salt around the world to remove ice that forms on our roads in the winter, and that's just scratching the surface. All of these examples are ways in which people shape and impact their environment. On the other hand, we can also see how the environment shapes people. Throughout the year, people will change their clothes due to the weather. Homes will be built differently depending on what resources are available or what natural disasters may occur. Even our dietary preferences will differ and reflect the food that a society can produce. Now, in talking about human-environment interaction, land use is bound to come up. Land use is how land is changed in order to be used for a specific purpose. When looking at how a society uses its land, we can not only see the impact on the environment, but also gain a better understanding of how developed their economy is, what industries are being promoted, and what cultural values are present in society. Traditionally, land use can be broken down into a variety of different categories. Agricultural land use is used for the production of different agricultural products for human or animal consumption. Industrial land use is land that is used to produce and manufacture different products. Commercial land use is land that is used to sell different final goods and services. Residential land use is land that's used for people to build homes on and live on. Recreational land use is used for people to relax on, such as parks, baseball fields, or campsites. And lastly, transportational land use consists of roads, railroads, airports, ports, or subways, all of which help people and goods get around. All these different land use patterns modify the Earth's surface to provide different goods and services for society, and 
show what values a society may have. Now, since we're talking about the environment and people, we also need to talk about sustainability. There are a lot of different definitions for what it means for a society to be sustainable, but it pretty much comes down to can a society meet the wants and needs of today's people without preventing future generations from being able to meet their wants and needs. In order for people to fulfill their wants and needs, they often consume natural resources, which are resources that are produced in nature. Natural resources can be broken up into two different categories, renewable resources and non-renewable resources. Renewable resources can be used multiple times without running out. For example, crops and trees can be replanted and theoretically have an unlimited supply, while non-renewable resources can only be used once, such as oil and natural gas, which theoretically means they have a limited supply. Once you use it, it's gone. When society does not take care of its natural resources, it can have disastrous consequences. For example, we could look at the RLC, which dried up during the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union diverted the rivers that flowed into the RLC to help with the irrigation of crops, which resulted in the majority of the sea disappearing. This destroyed not only the local ecosystems, but the economies of the local fishing villages and turned a once prosperous area into a desert. This is just one more example of how the environment and society impact and influence one another and how sometimes the consequences can be negative. So we can see that in order for society to be sustainable, it needs to work to reduce its environmental footprint and preserve both its renewable resources and non-renewable resources. All right, and just like that, another topic review video is done. Now you know the drill, the time has come to practice. Answer the questions on the screen and when you're done, you can check your answers in the comment section down below. Also, when you're down there, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and check out my ultimate review packet. It's a great resource that'll help you get an A in your class and a five on that national exam. As always, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time online.